first of all, this is our first in a series of Iris Brown Bag lectures. Christine is on um, sabbatical. She's normally our announcer, so we're missing yes. our official announcer. Mm -hmm. we, we miss her every day already. There are a million things she does that we're noticing we don't have anymore. We didn't know how to announce the talk on the today. We're lost. <laughs> but anyways, she's not here. Um, we're kind of in an interesting position right now because we're starting to develop a lot of different methods for consultation, both for faculty research and for faculty teaching related to DH. And so this is kind of a, a first foray into thinking about that, and, and we can continue to talk about what those processes might look like. Katie's here, and she's sort of our forerunner on all of that, so she might be able to drop in here and there. And I know a lot of you have been to Brown Bags in the past where we've talked about Omeka in particular. And one of the things we've been able to do in IRIS recently, after years of toil and trouble, is convince ITS to give us push button access to new uh, Omeka instances. So it feels like we've won a real battle, though we haven't, you know, had one where we have to actually make the push button thing happen yet. So don't hold your breath, but we could have Omeka instances at the ready for everyone. You get an Omeka, and you get an Omeka. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> Exciting day in the Iris Center. So this talk, should we turn off one light maybe? Is it hard to see from back there? Yeah. That's okay. This talk actually um, was a talk I put together for an invited lecture at Kansas University. And I have tried to reframe a few things for SIUE specific instances. Part of the other talk was mostly just about trying to explain why we are not KU at SIUE. And so I got to cut all of that out, which is great. Um, but there are a few moments when I think I'll stop and, and give you some more detail on, on theory behind certain pedagogical models. But mostly I want to just have the opportunity to talk to you about the kinds of DH pedagogy that I practice. Maybe here if you have examples from your own classrooms and then also just questions. So at any time if you want me to stop and you want to talk to me about a specific thing, let me know. I'm totally excited for that to happen. And in fact it means I won't get all nervous and start reading off my paper. So for everyone if you ask me questions in my experience. <laughs> okay. So the first question I think is always why would you do this in the first place? Especially in the humanities that has some pretty traditional things that happen. As, as researchers we write and in the classroom we often use the Socratic method to talk through ideas together and we write. And so it's very um, theoretical and critical in its construction and the idea behind DH pedagogy kind of turns that on its head. But I think it's important in this particular moment for a lot of reasons. And to me, this, this very first reason is all about the fact that students, and there's been a lot of studies about this recently, um, feel trapped and even depressed in digital environments. They don't have a lot of agency in those spaces when they think about social media and when they think about their day-to-day -day interactions online. And so, to me, the most empowering thing about DH pedagogy is that it can give students the opportunity to be building digital environments for themselves and kind of trying to find ways in which um, the digital environment is a format. It's not necessarily some kind of deterministic thing um, that has an effect on them. They can have an effect on it equally. Um, and then also, almost all disciplines in the humanities right now have some aspect of DH in them. So we're doing students a disservice if we're not demonstrating to them this is what's happening in the field right now. And then I think the biggest thing is it changes the way we understand writing instruction. And I think that happens across all disciplines because um, students are using formats and methods they've never used before when they're writing for digital environments. So it could be that they're trying to think about image and text or video and text together in new ways. It could be that they're doing descriptive work as opposed to just analytical papers. It could be that they have to think about how to build arguments for audiences that are beyond just me and the professor. So it really opens up a lot of possibilities for thinking about writing instruction that go beyond what happens in the traditional paper. I'm sure there are other reasons, <laughs> and I'm sure we'll get to them. Okay, so. Um, Today I'm really going to be talking about um, DH pedagogy in two particular environments. And the first, of course, is in the classroom. And in my experience, you can do this really small scale, or you can do it very large scale. So it could be, for example, just one day bringing in digital tools that are already available. So 
In my Whitman and Dickinson class, for example, we spent a lot of time looking at manuscripts from Whitman and Dickinson that wouldn't be available to students otherwise. And so it's sort of like they have the opportunity to do the kind of rare book work that I get to do as a scholar, but in the classroom here because we have access to that. So it could be as small as that, using things that are already available to them. It could be that they do really small scale, what they call lumen fade activities. You do it one day, and then you're out, you don't do it again, but maybe it has an impact. And then it could be that you have an entire course that engages with DH. And so Gabby here was a student in technology and literature last semester. It's the second time I've, I've taught that class. I think it went much better than the first time, but I've learned a lot from teaching that class over time. And then it could be a whole program of study that's focused on DH pedagogy. And so for Iris, that's the digital humanities and social sciences minor. The other context, though, is informal learning environments. And to me, these are critical bread and butter DH. Um, and they take lots of different forms, but if any of you have ever spent time in the Iris Center, you know that this work is happening there all the time. I spend as much time teaching in the Iris Center as I do in the classroom. And um, the teaching is much different in the Iris Center than it is in the classroom because um, students are my collaborators. We sit down, sometimes I'm teaching them the things that I know as a scholar, but lots of times, they're working to think through projects on their own and they really take on a role of ownership in that space. So informal learning to me really means um, students act as researchers on faculty projects in some aspect. Um, and to me that's what the Iris Center really can bring to the university because there's a lot of research into retention rates demonstrating that these kinds of high impact practices with students make a much bigger difference in terms of student success, students' ability to stay in college, and you can see that um, there's a lot of pictures here. Let's see, the far top left corner is Wide Wide World. That's one of our first group of Wide Wide Worlders, I think around 2011-12. All of those students went on to get library degrees, advanced um, PhDs, all kinds of things. So um, it's a really, <laughs> we have a good track record of, of having students come out of the Iris Center and, and go on to, to different programs and, and, and not drop out of the institution. <laughs> We're trying to think about that more in the Iris Center, too. What does this mean in terms of next steps? How does this go beyond the Iris Center and, and end up in other parts of the university? And I can talk about that at some point if you want. Okay, so to me, there are really five sound principles of DH pedagogy. I just talked and forgot all about where I was. <laughs> um, the first is that praxis encourages tink tinkering, building, and experimentation. Number two, environment, assignments, and assessments that should invite risk and consequent failure. Number three, you should create a project structure that includes collaboration, meaningful student contribution, and clear attribution of student work. Number four, you need an infrastructure that is accessible to students with a variety of abilities. And number five, curriculum that uses technology to reevaluate content or examines technology itself as a content. And we'll work through all of these in greater detail. So here's where a bit of the theory behind DH pedagogy comes in. The digital humanities is an incredibly diverse field that crosses periods, genres, and languages, as well as digital methods. As a result, there have been controversies about who and what is in and out. And in fact, digital humanists, um, probably to their detriment, use the phrase what's in and what's out more than they really should. But that's unfortunate. We'll, we'll give them a break, though. So these debates were best characterized by a 2011 Modern Language Association panel, History and Future of Digital Humanities, during which several speakers discussed divisions among practitioners. And versions of these 2011 talks were later collected in Matthew K. Gold's books, Debates in the Digital Humanities. And Stephen Ramsey's contribution to that collection describes coding as a new kind of hermeneutics in which the practice of coding or building things results in unique acts of interpretation. Um, Lots of times in my classroom, I talk about that as invention, the idea that you learn through doing, basically. Things that you wouldn't learn if you were thinking alone. Partly in response to Ramsey, Alan Liu argues that DH's focus on code and programming can dangerously forestall the discussion of cultural and theoretical questions that have occupied humanity scholarship during the 1980s and 90s. According to Liu, and this is really one of my favorite quotes, to be an equal partner rather than, again, just a servant at the table, 
digital humanists will need to find ways to show that thinking critically about metadata, for instance, scales into thinking critically about the power, finance, and other governance protocols of the world. Uh, the thing about those debates, though, is that it sort of created this binary, and I don't think either Lou or Ramsey meant to do that. Um, and in fact, I think what their debate exposed is an age-old division in the academy along these same lines, where we have research versus pedagogy. In literature, we have major author studies versus textual recovery. And more recently, we have digital tools versus DH content. And that just means, for any of you who spent any time with me and heard me complain about the National Endowment for the Humanities, they give all their money to tools and none of their <laughs> money to, to projects related to content. So this conversation has critically considered how DH scholarship might effectively bridge these divisions and hierarchies in the academy and encourage reflections on the socio-cultural implications of building through the very act of production. Um, and I think one of my favorite examples of this kind of questioning of Ramsey and Lou comes from Miriam Posner, who suggests you shouldn't exhort all of us to code because maybe we don't have the socio-cultural background in order for that to be something that's accessible to us. And so throughout my talk, I'll, I'll address ways in which we've tried to create the IRS centers as space that um, that focus on code comes later. And first, you have to find an entryway that's available to you. Um, similarly, in a part of the same panel at MLA, Catherine Harris discussed the limitations of engaging in DH scholarship at her institution, San Jose State, which um, doesn't have the funding, institutional support, research time, or access to graduate assistance that are typical at R1 institutions. And so by excluding pedagogy for such a long time from these debates, um, really it meant that, that institutions like SIU didn't have a seat at that table. Um, so in a lot of ways, the Iris Center is kind of revolutionary in that. We try to find ways to make research and pedagogy and community engagement sort of all fit together in one space. So that's building, which is really code-based. And in my experience, when I read Ramsey's work, it, it's often about you have to start from some raw materials and then create something. Um, but there's another discourse that I think is more helpful for pedagogy that is tinkering. And so tinkering is really more about, instead of building something new, taking a lot of materials that are already there and sort of playing with them to find something else, to sort of, not for a finished product, but to just kind of play and to see what results. And so this word's become really important in, in uh, not just digital humanities culture, but also in Silicon Valley. Tech enthusiasts, hacker culture, and the DIY movement so popular over the last 15 years has recuperated and romanticized the term tinker that was first applied to 13th century Scottish traveling cultures, which I think is kind of funny, <laughs> with some even referring to themselves as techno-gypsies to denote the melding of artisanal and technological belief systems and practices. So we don't usually use the word tinker in that particular way in the Iris Center, but I think what's interesting is that building also is a very masculine way to think about the work of the digital humanities. And so um, there are other feminine forms of work that could be just as useful as metaphors for thinking about the same kinds of pedagogy that we, we do participate in the IRS Center, like knitting, for example, or weaving. And they're all forms of, of learning that occur through haptic memory, so I think that's why that's important. So why tinker at all, I think, is the next question. My interest in tinkering and forms of tactile learning began when I was a student at the University of Iowa completing my PhD in the English department and a certificate in the Center for the Book. And uh, students in the Iris Center, Gabby included, have heard me say again and again, probably every paper I write begins with, I was a student in the Center for the Book, and then I delete it. But <laughs> it really formulated everything that there is to say about who I am as, as a thinker. So. At the center, I studied the history of the book, not just by reading and examining rare materials, but also by making paper. Rather than seeing these two aspects of my education as opposing entities, thinking and building became inseparable concepts to me. Beyond muscle memory, haptic learning, to me, involves practicing an action in order to understand and reflect on its social, political, and critical meaning. So I often place students in the role of curator in my classrooms in order to achieve this. I'll have them perform the same tasks in physical and digital environments to reflect on the similarities and differences between those formats. One example of this is in my senior assignment course about book history, in which students create a rare book exhibit in the library as well as one online. 
As students both develop and reflect on print and digital media, I ask them to replace a competitive, evolutionary narrative in which successive innovations replace outmoded technologies with a model more akin to Susan Gustafson's work, which explains that we should try, we should study verbal media as always emerging, always in flux, and always in relation to one another. By inhabiting roles related to media production as they build their exhibits, students begin to interrogate the ways in which print and digital media inform and influence one another. Students in the humanities are used to thinking in the abstract and writing in the abstract. Assignments that encourage tinkering are important because they encourage inquisitiveness by addressing how things work and eventually how they are constructed both physically and socially. And one example of this that I always like to talk about with students is Lisa Gittleman's discussion about reach out and touch, touch someone with a telephone. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind reach out and touch someone was that people felt intimidated by the telephone. The idea that they could talk to someone and that person wasn't in front of them, the only way that AT&T could make that accessible to them was to use this metaphor of reaching out and touching someone metaphorically, not physically. And that's just a way in which if you spend time working with, thinking about technologies and formats, you realize that we have all these social constructions around them that help us kind of form our impressions of what it means to participate in form. Will you make these slides available? I sure I will. Keep taking notes like a mad woman. <laughs> <laughs> of course we will. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll put them on the... We're working on a new Iris website. I'm telling mm -hmm. Matt and Trevor that. Katie and Ben have just basically revolutionized the Iris Center in a matter of months. <laughs> All things work now. It's miraculous. <laughs> Maybe not everything. <laughs> <laughs> Most things. Okay. We lose our old shoebox. But other than that, we're doing pretty well these days. <laughs> Uh, so digital humanities assignments at any scale should never be just about learning a tool. And I was just, in fact, talking about this at our um, department meeting today with Kowali. When you go in to use the online training, it just tells you how to do a bunch of things, but not why you're doing them, and so it's absolutely not helpful. So the tools in digital humanities are not the point. I don't go into a classroom and say, let's all figure out how to use Omeka. Um, it's always, it has to start from the content first, and then we use the tools to help us think about the content in new ways. I also understand, though, that trying to pick out tools to use in class can be stress-inducing, and so we can help with that. So here are just a few examples of tinkering assignments if you don't totally understand what I'm talking about yet. Um, so one is, if you, if you have any practice with web development at all, you know that a basic web page is formatted in HTML. But if you're working on a website and you want that formatting to be the same across all pages in a website, you need a CSS style sheet to do that work. Um, and so one example of tinkering is don't have students start from the ground up making their own CSS style sheets. This is Google Chrome's developer tools. And um, Ben's actually showed this before in other Iris um, talks we've had. But basically, in Digitally St. Louis, students just go in to developer code, make a small change, and then they can see it on the page. And they make really horrifying, unattractive websites in the process, but then it just all goes away. Um, I think this extends to work we do that's not just in digital environments too. So sometimes um, I bring sculpture clay to class and have students construct models of systems they see in text, just as an alternative example. Um, students sometimes make visual representations. In fact, Harry Potter students are doing this right now where they take a bunch of quotes and they remix them with visual elements to, to kind of rethink and refocus their experience with textual analysis. And then this last one, um, students make their own videos about historical context, context or about multiple manuscripts so that they're really taking something that, that is on paper and taking them into a new format to kind of reframe their thinking. And it puts them in the position of an expert too, which is often helpful. Any other questions so far? Okay. So this, I think, is one of the hardest things for students and for faculty to consider. But I think it's critical for DH projects to invite risk and failure. So failure has to be an option. <laughs> and I know because I've watched students fail at this multiple times. Um, the first is that if they know they have room to fail, they might just possibly become intrinsically motivated and excited to be there. Possibly. I'm not promising anything. <laughs> but it's different than 
it kind of takes their um, frame of reference away from grades for a second and lets them know, okay, I'm safe here to try something harder and not have to worry that I'm going to get a bad grade because I tried something harder and I didn't finish it. And then there are just some really clear um, reasons to do this that are practical. One is that it takes a lot of time to add DH into a curriculum like this. And so depending on how you do it, you need to give students the option to not finish things. And so even right now I have a student in the Harry Potter class who's decided she wants to make a, um, an app for the Marauders map. And we talked about the fact that you know if you plan it, if you have all the structure there and you don't actually execute the app, since you know nothing about app building, that's okay with me. It's okay to do that. I need to know that process is where we're putting our interest in, not a finished product. Also, students, like I said, they just don't have experience, and so they need a little bit more time. They need the option to fail. But it's really hard to set this up for students, and I've experienced it. I've, ex I've experienced their discomfort with it on multiple levels. In fact, right now in, in Harry Potter, we're using a um, learning contract, which I'll talk about again in a second. The first time they do that, they just have no concept around which to understand what it means that they get to choose their own grade and that they're planning their own learning. It's, it's really hard. I mean, it takes two weeks just to get the contract figured out for them. But then once it happens, it's great. Um, so you just have to create an environment that allows for this to operate smoothly. So one is you talk about the classroom as an environment and you reframe that space. So it becomes a studio, a lab, a makerspace, which when you have tables works really well. <laughs> it's not a classroom. And it's not the traditional classroom. Maybe sometimes we'll sit in circles, but not as much as I, I do in, say, my Whitman and Dickinson class. I often describe the class itself as an experiment, which makes them strangely more comfortable. This is an experimental space, and that means that I might fail just as much as you'll fail, and we've created an environment in which that's okay. So that they don't think, um, you know, if something goes wrong, I'm going to be angry at them immediately for that. We talk about failure itself, and we write failure narratives, too. And I tell them, wow, that was a really stupid assignment sheet. Or <laughs> and, and so sharing that and talking about what are the possibilities of that and what have we learned from failures becomes really important. We talk about process all the time, and I reward process instead of finished product. And I incentivize peer evaluation. I use contract grading, which we can talk about later if you have questions about it. And Gabby's been, you've been in classes where I've done contract reading, and you've been in classes when I don't, and they are hugely different, aren't they? I just sort of, the environment is different, and I feel different when I walk into them. You yeah. remember in the Steampunk and Dickens class, everybody was very close to having contract. They were, because there were students who had been in Harry Potter who were in the Dickens Meets Steampunk class, and I didn't go into Dickens Meets Steampunk with the plan of using the learning contract, but then the students from Harry Potter said, oh, we really want to do this again. And all those other students who had never experienced it said, no, we don't want to do that. That's terrifying. And so they voted, and we didn't, we didn't do it. So students really have to be um, guided into it carefully. You said you felt different when you walked into the two different. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, it's, it sort of has something to do with the level of being on. If that makes, I mean, if you that teach, you sense. know what, this, what that means. Um, but when I walk into Whitman and Dickinson, I know I'm performing in a particular way where I'm the authority, I have all this information to impart to them. Even if we're having discussions, it's still I'm the authority. Whereas when I walk into Harry Potter, um, I try to arrange things so that they start working in their groups before I even get there and, and sort of create that environment and so that I'm not as important as I am in Whitman and Dickinson. And I like being important, so that's, you know, that's <laughs> fun too, but it's really different. That makes sense. <laughs> so part of this is about a flipped classroom too, which I think can be a contentious term, but it, it generally means trying to develop tools so that students can learn outside of class, so that what happens in class becomes a makerspace and a lab, so that those kinds of things can happen. students credit for writing good peer evaluations. 
Um, and so sometimes that just means if I'm contract grading, it means that they get to use those, use the peer evaluations that they get back and also the peer evaluations they wrote as examples of their collaborative work. And if it's in a regular class, then I give them points. I mean, it is kind of funny because right now I have Harry Potter right after Whitman and Dickinson, and in Harry Potter there are 1,000 points, or in Whitman and Dickinson there are 1,000 points, and in Harry Potter there are no points at all. And <laughs> it's really funny, but... Okay, so contribution, attribution, and collaboration are key parts of this, and I think, you know, we're all used to doing group work. But group work to me is different than collaboration, and, and I think working in the digital humanities has really taught me that, that you have to teach students how to collaborate. And it's different than just saying, let's break out into groups of four and talk about a problem for a while and come back together and talk about it. You have to establish an environment in which collaboration happens. You have to talk about what it means to collaborate. You have to talk about the pitfalls. It has to be... Valerie, actually, early on when I was teaching one time, said something to me along the lines of, well, you have to explain to students why they're doing things, which seems obvious, but when you're first through teaching, you, you don't always realize that students don't know why in the world you're doing things. Um, and this definitely relates to collaboration. They don't understand. All that faculty ever tell them is, well, you're going to have to collaborate in the real world. But we don't ever tell them why or how or what it looks like. So here's our white, white rollers again, a different picture of them. I really, I heart them. <laughs> so um, part of what happens in the white, white world, but I think this happens in the classroom too, is that you have to establish a very strong sense of community early on. And um, so I've written a lot about this when it comes to what happens in the white, white world and in those informal learning environments. You have to allow students to develop their own expertise and teach other students. Um, we have full day workshops, and then part of the benefit of being there at all is the level of mentorship they receive, both from other students and from me. So there aren't a lot of other English majors like Wide Wide World students who get the opportunity to just talk to faculty all day long about what it is they want to do with their lives. Um, that's unique. Would you agree, Gabby? I know all about Gabby's life <laughs> and what she wants to do with it. And so it creates a really unique environment for that reason. And um, it's tiring, but it's, it's worth it for my research, it's worth it for the students. So I think this autonomy point relates as much to the classroom as it does to informal learning. Um, but it really gets to the heart of why contribution and attribution are, are critical here. So with the white, white world, all of the students are cited as project editors on the website, and they're all equally responsible for the project's outcomes. We solve problems together, students train one another and me, we meet weekly and I consult with them on every aspect of the project's design and methods. Having one-on-one -on -one time with a faculty member was one of the most rewarding aspects of my time on the wide, wide world. I had the opportunity to work side by side with Dr. Despain for two years. We solved major problems together and shared in frustrations and triumphs. I felt an immense sense of responsibility to this project. It was the first time that the work I was doing and the decisions I was making would affect not only the project that Dr. Despain had envisioned, but also how the project would look five years in the future to researchers. This project shaped who I was as a student and gave me the courage I needed to add my voice in with collaborations. So this can also happen in um, assignments. This is an example of Annotation Studio, and this is from English 200. And basically what happens is all the students are given the text of Dracula, and then they annotate certain sections, and then they can see one another's annotations. So they can see if they're thinking the same things, not the same things, through that process. So it's incredibly collaborative, and it's happening outside of class, so it means we have um, a higher level discussion as a result of what's happening in that space. And then the next thing is accessible infrastructure. So there are lots of digital tools you can use, and there are lots of options to think about in terms of how, what kinds of DH you want to do. So just on here we have Wayant, which is mostly about data mining. We have Omeka, which is mostly about archiving. We have WordPress, which is just a content management system, but can also be a blog. We have Scalar, which is about 
creating ebooks, sort of. That's what it calls itself, but it's not really. Um, and then Gephi, which isn't even on here, which is about networking. So there's lots of things you can do in class with different kinds of tools. So you just always have to weigh the benefits and disadvantages of those various platforms and of why you're using them. And one of the things you'll realize when you're working with them in the classroom or with students is that you have to give them the opportunity to get early access to something. So Omeka is really nice because, and WordPress is really nice because it's designed in a way that students are familiar with. They can jump right in, but then it gives them opportunities later to change things as they learn more. Whereas lots of times when it comes to R1 Digital Humanities research, they really suggest you build projects from the ground up and you don't use any of those content management systems, but they don't realize that at places like this we're working really closely with students, that it's necessary to use some of those. So those are just kind of the benefits and disadvantages you need to think through. And again, we've been talking a lot about that at IRIS and we have a process for it now, so we can walk through it with you. I think you know most of the students who are involved in the wide, wide world come to us with absolutely no technological expertise at all. Um, and they are also of the groups that are um, usually stereotyped as not having abilities in computer science and technology. And so they, they feel intimidated before they even arrive. And so we've tried to do what we can to allay some of that intimidation and to give them an entry point so that they feel later like they can do more things. Sometimes faculty come to our center with no technical experience at all. Yes. And then and everything you just said applies to them too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're living up to that. John. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so this technology as content and content as technology relates to everything we talked about when we were talking about building and tinkering. And I think it's the most important point, and it's really the last point that I want to make but it just demonstrates that all digital projects should be tied to content in some way. So in the case of the wide, wide world, students are reading the novel and working with physical editions so that the work they do has a purpose and they have a voice in the larger project goals. Um, students in the Digitally St. Louis project, they don't just write code, they're building WordPress sites, and they're doing a lot of work out in East St. Louis itself. They're interviewing people, they're taking photographs, so even thinking about those um, in real life IRL experiences and how they ultimately transfer to online experiences, I think is really critical. And I think this is maybe one of the better examples of it. In technology and literature, this last time, we worked on British and American science fiction from the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century to think about how that moment, which was a cultural shift, related to our own cultural technological shift so that the content that they were working with directly applied to the ways in which they were thinking about content in our current moment. Is that right, Gabby? Okay. <laughs> You're like, whatever, just pain. <laughs> Um, and then, always, too, technology itself needs to be considered in a social context. Um, so, in 1991, Judith Blockman inserted gender into the already growing body of scholarship, arguing against technological determinism. Technologies result from a series of specific decisions made by particular groups of people in particular places at particular times for their own purposes. As such, technologies bear the imprint of the people and social context in which they developed. And I think this is just critical for all DH work, and to me it's, it's kind of the point, in a way, to, to, to help students understand that technology, too, is a cultural construct, that we made it, and every DH activity we engage in is about them thinking about how they're making it and how they can influence culture through that process. It's, it's sort of my high horse about how I think we can change the world, because it means that they're actively um, realizing that they're not a slave to that system, that they don't want to be. There's a way. There's a way out of there. There's a way for them to rewrite that narrative. That is all. <laughs> through the IRIS Center for your class. Okay. And um, so 
in the past, I've done a lot of different things. I've made it so that every student has their own WordPress, and that's just free through WordPress. Or I've made one big WordPress site where students are collaborating together actively, and I found that that's usually the better model. And um, in technology and literature, it was the case that we were doing so much back-end coding that I wanted us to have one that was um, hosted outside of WordPress. And so um, we, that one I ended up paying for. But now that we have it on campus, the way that we set it up through the IRA Center, you wouldn't have to pay for any hosting. And we could help you get it set up. So if I, if I understood what you said correctly, so you, if you you could have a WordPress site hosted through Iris where the class would collaboratively work to build that mm -hmm. that WordPress site, what would we we just have to contact you? Yeah, just there? contact us, and we have a we have a new intake process for teachers who want to think about how to incorporate DH into the classroom. So, okay. <laughs> and you can be our first guinea pig if you want, Larry. Okay. <laughs> 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 and I will say that the WordPress, creating WordPress, a new WordPress site, we know works and is fast. Yes. Yeah. There's no, that's easier Omeka. than Omeka. Yes. Well, Christine and I had a WordPress site for the Southern Illinois Dialects Project. And it was hosted then on GoDaddy, which we, of course, had to pay for. Um, and then at some point it got hacked and the whole thing became useless to us. So. Um, but I, 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 I'm hopefully there's more, it's some years ago now, so hopefully they've got, I think WordPress was still in its WordPress earlier. you just have to update really regularly so that it doesn't get hacked because it's one of those systems that everybody's using and so it's a target. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so you can do that and um, I also have a lot of different assignment sheets that if you wanted to borrow about how to how to set up a WordPress environment like that for sure. students to belong. My online class, English 445, is all through WordPress instead of through Blackboard. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do that because they can collaborate in it? or I do it partly because I can't myself look at Blackboard all day long without going insane. And I have to look at it all day long when I'm teaching a summer class. And partly because it kind of creates, it creates this a pleasant space to be in, and it encourages long-form writing in a way that I don't think the discussion board in Blackboard does. So, you know, that I'm a format junkie, and I just like the format more. Mm -hmm. well, it also then looks like something more that is meant to be read as, a, as opposed to just posting it for an assignment for credit. Right, right. You know, like, it, feels, yeah. it feels like they're in a book club for the summer together. Right, and it looks like other things that they see, you know, mm -hmm. so it gives them that, you know, it's a real, it's professionalizing too in that sense, right? Any other questions you can think of or thoughts about particular assignments? Joanna, well, since you were writing like mad, if you had anything particular. This is great. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Rachel had a question. I did, um, so you talk a lot about using this in your upper level courses, but what about like first year writing? Have you experimented with that? Or with I have used blogs in first year writing a lot. Yeah. And that works really well. Um, I'm trying to think of what other things. I've used annotations before in first year writing and various things. So That's free software. That's free software. Everything is open access, so. 